We are on page 38, and this is part three. And just as a reminder, this takes place on Friday evening. If you don't have any of this written down, go ahead and write that on page 38. Although there was evening brightness showing through the windows of the bunkhouse, inside it was dusk. Through the open door came the thuds and occasional clangs of a horseshoe game, and now and then the sounds of voices raised in approval or derision. Slim and George came into the darkening bunkhouse together. Slim reached up over the card table and turned on the tin-shaded electric light. Instantly, the table was brilliant with light, and the cone of the shade threw its brightness straight downward, leaving the corners of the bunkhouse still in dusk. Slim sat down on a box, and George took his place opposite. It wasn't nothing, said Slim. I would have had to drown most of them anyways. No need to thank me about that. George said, it wasn't much to you, maybe, but it was a hell of a lot to him. Jesus Christ, I don't know how we're going to get him to sleep in here. He'll want to sleep right out in the barn with them. We'll have trouble keeping him from getting right in the box with them pups. It wasn't nothing, Slim repeated. Say, you sure was right about him. Maybe he ain't bright, but I never seen such a worker. He damn near killed his partner, Buck and Barley. There ain't nobody can keep up with him. God almighty, I never seen such a strong guy. George spoke proudly. Just tell Lenny what to do, and he'll do it if it don't take no figuring. He can't think of nothing to do himself, but he sure can take orders. So let's pause and think about this question. Here, George is speaking proudly when he's explaining how Lenny works. Why is he speaking proudly? There was a clang of horseshoe on iron stake outside and a little cheer of voices. Slim moved back slightly so the light was not on his face. Funny how you and him string along together. It was Slim's calm invitation to confidence. What's funny about it? George demanded defensively. Oh, I don't know. Hardly none of the guys ever travel together. I hardly never seen two guys travel together. You know how the hands are. They just come in and get their bunk and work a month, and then they quit and go out alone. Never seemed to give a damn about nobody. It just seems kind of funny, a cuckoo like him and a smart little guy like you traveling together. He ain't no cuckoo, said George. He's dumb as hell, but he ain't crazy. And I ain't so bright neither, or I wouldn't be bucking barley for my 50 and found. If I was bright, I was even a little bit smart. I'd have my own little place, and I'd be bringing in my own crops instead of doing all the work and not getting what comes up out of the ground. So I want you to reread what I have underlined here. And I want you to rephrase in your own words what George wants to do. George fell silent. He wanted to talk. Slim neither encouraged nor discouraged him. He just sat back quiet and receptive. So here's a word that I want you to look up if you don't know what that means. It ain't so funny, him and me going around together, George said at last. Him and me was both born in Auburn. I knowed his Aunt Clara. She took him when he was a baby and raised him up. When his Aunt Clara died, Lenny just come along with me out working. Got kind of used to each other after a little while, um, said Slim. George looked over at Slim and saw the calm, godlike eyes fastened on him. Funny, said George. I used to have a hell of a lot of fun with him. Used to play jokes on him because he was too dumb to take care of himself. But he was too dumb even to know he had a joke played on him. I had fun. Made me seem goddamn smart alongside of him. Why, he'd do any damn thing I told him. If I told him to walk over a cliff, over he'd go. That wasn't so damn much fun after a while. He never got mad about it neither. I beat the hell out of him and he could have bust every bone in my body just with his hands. But he never lifted a finger against me. So I want you to pause here. Based on this story that he just told, and especially this line I have underlined here, how does Lenny feel about George? Go ahead and write that in the margin. 
George's voice was taking on the tone of a confession. Tell you what made me stop that? One day a bunch of guys was standing around up on the Sacramento River. I was feeling pretty smart. I turned to Lenny and says, jump in. And he jumped. Couldn't swim a stroke. He damn near drowned before we could get him. And he was so damn nice to me for pulling him out. Clean forgot I told him to jump in. Well, I ain't done nothing like that no more. He's a nice fella, said Slim. But I don't need no sense to be a nice fella. Seems to me sometimes it just works the other way around. Take a real smart guy and he ain't hardly ever a nice fella. George stacked the scattered cards and began to lay out his solitaire hand. The shoes thudded on the ground outside. At the windows, the light of the evening still made the window squares bright. I ain't got no people, George said. I seen the guys go around on the ranches alone. That ain't no good. They don't have no fun. After a long time, they get mean. They get wanting to fight all the time. So let's pause here. Think about the way that Steinbeck wrote this quote that George is saying here. And then answer this question, what is Steinbeck saying about loneliness in this moment? Yeah, they get mean, Slim agreed. They get so they don't want to talk to nobody. Of course, Lenny's a goddamn nuisance most of the time, said George. But you get used to going around with a guy and you can't get rid of him. So if this word is new to you, go ahead and look up nuisance. He ain't mean, said Slim. I can see Lenny ain't a bit mean. Of course he ain't mean, but he gets in trouble all the time because he's so goddamn dumb. Like what happened in weed? He stopped, stopped in the middle of turning over a card. He looked alarmed and peered over at Slim. You wouldn't tell nobody? What are you doing weed? Slim asked calmly. You wouldn't tell? No, of course you wouldn't. What are you doing weed? Slim asked again. Well, he's seen this girl in a red dress. Dumb bastard like he is. He wants to touch everything he likes. Just wants to feel it. So he reaches out to feel this red dress and the girl lets out a squawk. And that gets Lenny all mixed up. And he holds on because that's the only thing he can think to do. Well. This girl squawks and squawks. I was just a little bit off, and I heard all the yelling, so I comes running. And by that time, Lenny's so scared, all he can think to do is just hold on. I socked him over the head with a fence picket to make him let go. He was so scared, he couldn't let go of that dress. And he's so goddamn strong, you know. Slim's eyes were level and unwinking. He nodded very slowly. So, what happens? George carefully built his line of solitaire cards. Well, that girl rabbits in and tells the law she's been raped. The guys in weeds start a party out to lynch Lenny. So we sit in the irrigation ditch underwater all the rest of that day. Got only our heads sticking out from the side of the ditch. And that night, we scrammed out of there. Slim sat in silence for a moment. Didn't hurt the girl none, huh? He asked finally. Hell no, he just scared her. I'd be scared too if he grabbed me, but he never hurt her. He just wanted to touch that red dress like he wants to pet them pups all the time. So let's pause. Why do you think George decided to tell Slim about what happened in Weed? He could have kept it a secret, but he decided to tell Slim. Why? He ain't mean, said Slim. I can tell a mean guy a mile off. Of course he ain't, and he'll do any damn thing I... Lenny came in through the door. He wore his blue denim coat over his shoulders like a cape, and he walked hunched way over. Hi, Lenny, said George. How do you like the pup now? Lenny said breathlessly. He's brown and white, just like I wanted. He went directly to his bunk and lay down and turned his face to the wall and drew up his knees. George put down his cards very deliberately. Lenny, he said sharply, 
when he twisted his neck and looked over his shoulder. Huh? What do you want, George? I told you, you couldn't bring that pup in here. What pup, George? I ain't got no pup. George went quickly to him, grabbed him by the shoulder, and rolled him over. He reached down and picked the tiny puppy from where Lenny had been concealing it against his stomach. Lenny sat up quickly. Give him to me, George. George said, you get right up and take this pup back to the nest. He got asleep with his mother. You want to kill him? Just born last night, and you take him out of the nest. You take him back, or I'll tell Slim not to let you have him. Lenny held out his hands pleadingly. Give him to me, George. I'll take him back. I didn't mean no harm, George. Honest, I didn't. I just wanted to pet him a little. George handed the pup to him. All right, you get him back there quick, and don't you take him out no more. You'll kill him the first thing you know. Lenny fairly scuttled out of the room. Let's pause here. George is saying that he'll kill him if he keeps treating him this way, the, the puppy. Does George really think that Lenny could kill the puppy, or is he exaggerating? And why do you think that? Slim had not moved. His calm eyes followed Lenny out the door. Jesus, he said. He's just like a kid, ain't he? Sure, he's just like a kid. There ain't no more harm in him than a kid neither, except he's so strong. I bet he won't come in here to sleep tonight. He'd sleep right alongside that box in the barn. Well, let him. He ain't doing no harm out there. It was almost dark outside now. Old Candy, the swamper, came in and went to his bunk, and behind him struggled his old dog. Hello, Slim. Hello, George. Didn't either of you play horseshoes? So just a quick reminder that Candy, the swamper, he was the guy who was cleaning. He had one hand and he was that really old dog. I don't like to play every night, said Slim. Candy went on. Either you guys got a slug of whiskey? I got a gut ache. I ain't, said Slim. I'd drink it myself if I had. And I ain't got a gut ache neither. Got a bad gut ache, said Candy. Them goddamn turnips gave it to me. I know they was going to before I ever eat them. The thick-bodied Carlson came in out of the darkening yard. He walked to the other end of the bunkhouse and turned on the second shaded light. It's darker in hell in here, he said. Jesus, how that friggin' pit shoes. He's plenty good, said Slim. Damn right he is, said Carlson. He don't give nobody else a chance to win. He stopped and sniffed the air, and still sniffing, looked down at the old dog. God almighty, that dog stinks. Get him out of here, Candy. I don't know nothing that stinks as bad as an old dog. You gotta get him out. Candy rolled to the edge of his bunk. He reached over and patted the ancient dog, and he apologized. I've been around him so much, I never noticed how he stinks. Well, I can't stand him in here, said Carlson. That stink hangs around even after he's gone. He walked over with his heavy-legged stride and looked down at the dog. Got no teeth, he said. He's all stiff with rheumatism. He ain't no good to you, Candy, and he ain't no good to himself. Why don't you shoot him, Candy? The old man squirmed uncomfortably. Well, how? I had him so long. Had him since he was a pup. I herded sheep with him, he said proudly. You wouldn't think it to look at him now, but he was the best damn sheep sheepdog I ever seen, George said. I've seen a guy in weed that had an Airedale could herd sheep. Learned it from the other dogs. Carlson was not to be put off. Look, Candy, this old dog just suffers himself all the time. If you was to take him out and shoot him right in the back of the head, he leaned over and pointed, right there, why, he'd never know what hit him. Candy looked around unhappily. No, he said softly. No, I couldn't do that. I had him too long. 
He don't have no fun, Carlson insisted. And he stinks to beat hell. Tell you what, I'll shoot him for you. Then it won't be you that does it. Candy threw his legs off his bunk. He scratched the white stubble whiskers on his cheek nervously. I'm so used to him, he said softly. I, I had him from a pup. Well, you ain't being kind to him, keeping him alive, said Carlson. Look, Slim's bitch got a litter right now. I bet Slim would give you one of them pups to raise up, wouldn't you, Slim? Okay, let's pause here, and I'm actually going to have you reread page 44 and 45. So, just we're in the middle of 45. Go back up to 44, and then answer this question. Why did Carlson think Candy's dog would be better off dead? Do you agree, and why or why not? So Skinner had been studying the old dog with his calm eyes. Yeah, he said, you can have a pup if you want to. He seemed to shake himself free for speech. Carl's right, Candy. That dog ain't no good to himself. I wish somebody'd shoot me if I got old and a cripple. Candy looked helplessly at him, for Slim's opinions were law. Maybe it had hurt him, he suggested. I don't mind taking care of him. Carlson said, the way I'd shoot him, he wouldn't feel nothing. I put the gun right there. He pointed with his toe, right back of the head. He wouldn't even quiver. Candy looked for help from face to face. It was quite dark outside by now. A young laboring man came in. His sloping shoulders were bent forward, and he walked heavily on his heels as though he carried the invisible grain bag. He went to his bunk and put his hat on his shelf. Then he picked a pulp magazine from his shelf and brought it to the light over the table. Can I show you this, Slim? He asked. Show me what? The young man turned to the back of the magazine, put it down on the table, and pointed with his finger. Right there. Read that. Slim bent over it. Go on, said the young man. Read it aloud. Dear Editor, Slim read slowly. I, re I read your mag for six years, and I think it is the best on the market. I like stories by Peter Rand. I think he is a wingding. Give us more like the Dark Rider. I don't write many letters, just thought I would tell you. I think your mag is the best dime's worth I ever spent. Slim looked up questioningly. What you want me to read that for? Wit said, go on, read the name at the bottom. Slim read, Yours for success, William Tenor. He glanced up at Wit again. What you want me to read that for? Wit closed the magazine impressively. Don't you remember Bill Tenor? Worked here about three months ago? Slim thought. Little guy, he asked. Drove a cultivator? That's him, Wit cried. That's the guy. You think he's the guy who wrote this letter? I know it. Bill and me was in here one day. Bill had one of them books that just come. He was looking in it. And he says, I wrote a letter. Wonder if they put it in the book. But it wasn't there. Bill says, maybe they're saving it for later. And that's just what they've done. There it is. Guess you're right, said Slim. Got it right in the book. George held out his hand for the magazine. Let's look at it. Whit found the place again, but he did not surrender his hold on it. He pointed out the letter with his forefinger. And then he went to his box shelf and laid the magazine carefully in. I wonder if Bill's seen it, he said. Bill and me worked in that patch of field bees. Run cultivators, both of us. Bill was a hell of a nice fella. During the conversation, Carlson had refused to be drawn in. He continued to look down at the old dog. Candy watched him uneasily. At last, Carlson said, If you want me to... I'll put the old devil out of his misery right now and get it over with. Ain't nothing left for him. Can't eat, can't see, can't even walk without hurting. Candy said hopefully, You ain't got no gun. The hell I ain't. Got a luger. It won't hurt him none at all. Candy said, Maybe tomorrow. Let's wait till tomorrow.
I don't see no reason for it, said Carlson. He went to his bunk, pulled his bag from underneath it, and took out a Luger pistol. Let's get it over with, he said. We can't sleep with him stinking around in here. He put the pistol in his hip pocket. Candy looked a long time at Slim to try to find some reversal, and Slim gave him none. At last, Candy said softly and hopelessly, All right, take him. He did not look down at the dog at all. He lay back on his bunk and crossed his arms behind his head and stared at the ceiling. From his pocket, Carlson took a little leather thong. He stooped over and tied it around the old dog's neck. All the men except Candy watched him. Come, boy. Come on, boy, he said gently. And he said apologetically to Candy, he won't even feel it. Candy did not move nor answer him. He twitched the thong. This we're talking about like a, a leash. Come on, boy. The old dog got slowly and stiffly to his feet and followed the gently pulling leash. Slim said, Carlson? Yeah? You know what to do. What you mean, Slim? Take a shovel, said, said Slim shortly. Oh, sure, I get you. He led the dog out into the darkness. George followed to the door and shut the door and set the latch gently in its place. Candy lay rigidly on his bed, staring at the ceiling. Slim said loudly, One of my lead mules got a bad hoof. Gotta get some tar on it. His voice trailed off. It was silent outside. Carlson's footsteps died away. The silence came into the room, and the silence lasted. George chuckled. <laughs> I bet Lenny's right out there in the barn with his pup. He won't want to come in here no more now he's got a pup. Slim said, Candy, you can have any one of them pups you want. Candy did not answer. The silence fell on the room again. It came out of the night and invaded the room. George said, Anybody like to play a little euchre? I'll play out a few with you, said Wit. They took places opposite each other at the table under the light, but George did not shuffle the cards. He rippled the edge of the deck nervously, and the little, little snapping noise drew the eyes of all the men in the room so that he stopped doing it. The silence fell on the room again. A minute passed, and another minute. Candy lay still, staring at the ceiling. Slim gazed at him for a moment, and then looked down at his hands. He subdued one hand with the other, and held it down. There came a little gnawing sound from under the floor, and all the men looked down toward it gratefully. Only Candy continued to stare at the ceiling. Sounds like there was a rat under there, said George. We ought to set, get a trap down there. Whip broke out. What the hell's taking him so long? I have some cards, why don't you? We ain't going to get no euchre played this way. George brought the cards together tightly and studied the backs of them. The silence was in the room again. A shot sounded in the distance. The men looked quickly at the old man. Every head turned toward him. For a moment, he continued to stare at the ceiling, then he rolled slowly over and faced the wall and lay silent. So let's pause and think about how Candy feels in this situation. Right, because a shot sounded in the distance, which means that he heard that his dog just got shot with a gun. And then he turns away and faces the wall silently. So if you were Candy in this situation, how would you feel? George shuffled the cards noisily and dealt them. Wit drew a scoring board to him and set the pegs to start. Wit said, I guess you guys really come here to work. How do you mean? George asked. Wit laughed. Well, you come on a Friday. You got two days to work till Sunday. I don't see how you figure, figure said George. Whit laughed again. 
You do if you've been around these big ranches much. Guy that wants to look over a ranch comes in Saturday afternoon. He gets Saturday night supper and three meals on Sunday, and he can quit Monday morning after breakfast without turning his hand. But you come to work Friday noon. You got to put in a day and a half, no matter how you figure. George looked at him levelly. We're going to stick around a while, he said. Me and Lenny's going to roll up a steak. The door opened quietly, and the stable buck put in his head. A lean negro head, lined with pain, the eyes patient. Mr. Slim? Slim took his eyes from old candy. Huh? Oh, hello, crooks. What's the matter? You told me to warm up tar for that mule's foot? I got it warm. Oh, sure, Crooks. I'll come right out and put it on. I can do it if you want, Mr. Slim. No, I'll come do it myself. He stood up. Crooks said, Mr. Slim? Yeah. That big new guy is messing around your pups out in the barn. Well, he ain't doing no harm. I give him one of those pups. Just thought I'd tell you, said Crook. He's taking, a, taking them out of the nest and handling them. That won't do them no good. He won't hurt him, said Slim. I'll come along with you now. George looked up. If that crazy bastard's fooling around too much, just kick him out, Slim. Slim followed the stable buck out of the room. George dealt and Wit picked up his cards and examined them. Seen the new kid yet? He asked. What kid? George asked. Why, Curly's new wife. Yeah. I've seen her. <laughs> well, ain't she a Lulu? And that means good looking. I ain't seen that much of her, said George. Whit laid down his cards impressively. Well, stick around and keep your eyes open. You'll see plenty. She ain't concealing nothing. I never seen nobody like her. She got the eye going all the time on everybody. I bet she even gives the stable buck the eye. I don't know what the hell she wants. George said casually. Been any trouble since she got here? It was obvious that Wit was not interested in his cards. He laid his hand down and George scooped it in. George laid out his deliberate solitaire hand, seven cards and six on top and five on top of those. Wit said, I see what you mean. Nah, they ain't been nothing yet. Curly's got yellow jackets in his drawers, but... That's all so far. Every time the guys is around, she shows up. She's looking for Curly, or she thought she left something laying around, and she's looking for it. Seems like she can't keep away from guys. And Curly's pants is just crawling with ants, but there ain't nothing come of it yet. George said, she's going to make a mess. They're going to be a bad mess about her. She's a jailbait all set on the trigger. That Curly got his work cut out for him. Ranch with a bunch of guys on it ain't no place for a girl, especially like her. So, thinking about this time frame, where we are in history, and the beliefs about women especially, what might George think is the place for a woman? Wit said, if you got ideas, you ought to come in town with us guys tomorrow night. Why? What's doing? Just the usual thing. We go into old Susie's place. Hell of a nice place. Old Susie's a laugh. Always cracking jokes. Like she says when we come up the front porch last Saturday night. Susie opens the door and then she yells over her shoulder, get your coats on, girls. Here comes the sheriff. She never talks dirty, neither. Got five girls there. What's it set you back? George asked. Two and a half. You can get a shot for two bits. Susie got nice chairs set in too. If a guy don't want to flop, why, he can just sit in the chairs and have a couple or three shots and pass the time of day. Susie don't give a damn. She ain't rushing guys through and kicking them out if they don't want to flop. Might go in and look the joint over, said George. Sure, come along. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Her cracking jokes all the time. Like she says one time, she says, I've knew people 
that if they got a rag rug on the floor and a cupid doll lamp on the phonograph, they think they're running a parlor house. That's Clara's house she's talking about. And Susie says, I know what you boys want. She says, my girls is clean. She says, and there ain't no water in my whiskey. She says, if any of you guys want to look at a cupid doll lamp and take your own chance getting burned, why, you know where to go. And she says, there's guys around here walking bow-legged because they like to look at a cupid doll lamp. George asks, Clara runs the other house, huh? Yeah, said Whip. We don't never go there. Clara gets three bucks a crack and 35 cents a shot, and she don't crack no joke. But Susie's place is clean, and she got nice chairs. Don't let no goo-goos in, either. Me and Lenny's rolling up a steak, said George. I might go in and set and have a shot, but I ain't putting out no two and a half. Well, a guy gotta have some fun sometime, said Whip. The door opened, and Lenny and Carlson came in together. Lenny crept to his bunk and sat down, trying not to attract attention. Carlson reached under his bunk and brought out his bag. He didn't look at old Candy, who still faced the wall. Carlson found a little cleaning rod in the bag and a can of oil. He laid them on his bed and then brought out the pistol, took out the magazine, and snapped the loaded shell from the chamber. Then he fell to cleaning the barrel with the little rod. When the ejector snapped, Candy turned over and looked for a moment at the gun before he turned back to the wall again. Carlson said casually, Curly been in yet? No, said Wit. What's eating on Curly? Carlson squinted down the barrel of his gun. Looking for his old lady. I seen him going round and round outside, Wit said sarcastically. He spends half his time looking for her, and the rest of the time she's looking for him. Curly burst into the room excitedly. And you guys see my wife? he demanded. She ain't been here, said Whit. Curly looked threateningly about the room. Where the hell's Slim? Went out in the barn, said George. He was going to put some tar on a split hoof. Curly's shoulders dropped and squared. How long ago did he go? Five, ten minutes? Curly jumped out the door and banged it after him. Wit stood up. I guess maybe I'd like to see this, he said. Curly's just spoiling, or he wouldn't start for Slim. And Curly's handy. Goddamn handy. Got in the finals for the Golden Glove. He got newspaper clippings about it. He considered, but just the same, he better leave Slim alone. Nobody don't know what Slim can do. Think Slim's with his wife, don't he? said George. Looks like it, Wit said. Of course, Slim ain't. At least, I don't think Slim is, but I like to see the fuss if it comes off. Come on, let's go. George said, I'm staying right here. I don't want to get mixed up in nothing. Lenny and me gotta make a stake. Carlson finished the cleaning of the gun and put it in the bag and pushed the bag under his bunk. I guess I'll go out and look her over, he said. Old Candy lay still, and Lenny, from his bunk, watched George cautiously. When Wit and Carlson were gone and the door closed after them, George turned to Lenny. What you got on your mind? I ain't done nothing, George. Slim says I better not put them pups, pet them pups so much for a while. Slim says it ain't good for them, so I come right in. I've been good, George. I could have told you that, said George. Well, I wasn't hurting them none. I just had mine in my lap petting it. George asked, did you see Slim out in the barn? Sure I did. He told me I better not pet that pup no more. Did you see that girl? You mean Curly's girl? Yeah. Did she come in the barn? No. Anyways, I never seen her. You never seen Slim talking to her? Uh-uh. She ain't been in the barn. Okay, said George. I guess some guys ain't gonna see no fight. If there's any fight in Lenny, you keep out of it. I don't want no fights, said Lenny. He got up from his bunk and sat down at the table across from George. 
Almost automatically, George shuffled the cards and laid out his solitaire hand. He used a deliberate, thoughtful slowness. Lenny reached for a face card and studied it, then turned it upside down and studied it. Both ends the same, he said. George, why is it both ends the same? I don't know, said George. That's just the way they make them. What was Slim doing in the barn when you seen him? Slim? Sure. You seen him in the barn, and he told you not to pet the pup so much. Oh, yeah. He had a can of tar and a paintbrush. I don't know what for. You sure that girl didn't come in like she come in here today? No, she never come. George sighed. You give me a good whorehouse every time, he said. A guy can go in and get drunk and get everything out of his system all at once and no messes. And he knows how much it's going to set him back. These here jail baits is just set on the trigger of the hoose gal. Lenny followed his words admiringly and moved his lips a little to keep up. George continued, you remember Andy Cushman, Lenny? Went to grammar school? The one that his old lady used to make hot cakes for the kids? Lenny asked, yeah, that's the one. You can remember anything if there's anything to eat in it. George looked carefully at the solitaire hand. He put an ace up on his scoring rack and piled a two, three, and four of diamonds on it. Andy's in San Quentin right now, on account of a tart, said George. That means because of a woman. Lenny drummed on the table with his fingers. George? Huh. George, how long is it going to be till we get that little place and live on the fat of the land and rabbits? I don't know, said George. We gotta get a big stake together. I know a little place we can get cheap, but they ain't giving it away. Old Candy turned slowly over. His eyes were wide open. He watched George carefully. Lenny said, Tell about that place, George. I just told you, just last night. Go on, tell again, George. Well, it's ten acres, said George. Got a little windmill. Got a little shack on it and a chicken run. Got a kitchen, orchard, cherries, apples, peaches, tots, nuts. Got a few berries. There's a place for alfalfa and plenty water to flood it. There's a pig pen. And rabbits, George. No place for rabbits now, but I could easy build a few hutches and you could feed alfalfa to the rabbits. Damn right I could, said Lenny. You goddamn right I could. George's hand stopped working with the cards. His voice was growing warmer. And we could have a few pigs. I could build a smokehouse like the one Grandpa had. And when we kill a pig, we could smoke the bacon and the hams and make sausage and all like that. And when the salmon run up river, we could catch a hundred of them and salt them down or smoke them. We could have them for breakfast. They ain't nothing so nice as smoked salmon. When the fruit come in... We could can it, and tomatoes, they're easy to can. Every Sunday, we'd kill a chicken or a rabbit. Maybe we'd have a cow or a goat. The cream is so goddamn thick, thick, you got to cut it with a knife and take it out with a spoon. Lenny watched him with wide eyes, and Old Candy watched him too. Lenny said softly, We can live off the fat of the land. Sure, said George. All kinds of vegetables in the garden. And if we want a whiskey, we can sell a few eggs or something, or some milk. We just live there. We would belong there. There wouldn't be no more running around the country and getting fed by a Jap cook. No, sir. We'd have our own place where we belonged and not sleep in no bunkhouse. So let's pause here. Based on George's dreams, like how excited he is when he's explaining this possible future farm, what does this tell us about how George feels about his life now? Tell about the house, George, Lenny begged. Sure, we'd have a little house and a room to ourselves, little fat iron stove, and in the winter we'd keep a fire going in it. It ain't enough land, so we'd have to work it ain't enough land, so we'd have to work too hard. Maybe six, seven hours a day. 
we wouldn't have to buck no barley 11 hours a day. And when we put in a crop lie, we'd be, be there to take the crop up. We'd know what come of our planting. A rabbit, Lenny said eagerly, and I'd take care of him. Tell how I do that, George. Sure. You'd go out in the alfalfa patch, and you'd have a sack. You'd fill up the sack and bring it in and put it in the rabbit cages. They'd nibble and they'd nibble, said Lenny. The way they do, I seen them. Ever six weeks or so, George continued, them does would throw a litter, and we'd have plenty rabbits to eat and sell, and we'd keep a few pigeons to go flying around the windmill like they'd done when I was a kid. He looked raptly at the wall over Lenny's head. If this is a word you're not familiar with, go ahead and look up raptly. And it'd be our own and nobody could can us. If we don't like a guy, we can say, get the hell out. And by God, he's got to do it. And if a friend come along, what? We'd have an extra bunk. And we'd say, why don't you spend the night? And by God, he would. We'd have a setter dog and a couple striped cats. But you got to watch out. Them cats don't get the little rabbits. Lenny breathed hard. You just let them try to get the rabbits. I'll break their goddamn necks. I'll, I'll smash them with a stick. He subsided, grumbling to himself threatening the future cats, which might dare to disturb the future rabbits. Based on Lenny's response here, use an adjective to describe him. George sat entranced with his own picture. And here's another word. If you don't know what entranced means, look that up. When Candy spoke, they both jumped as though they had been caught doing something reprehensible. And here's another word to look up if you don't know it. Reprehensible. Candy said, you know where's a place like that? George was on guard immediately. Suppose I do, he said. What's that to you? You don't need to tell me where it's at. Might be any place. Sure, said George. That's right. You couldn't find it in a hundred years. Candy went on excitedly. How much they want for a place like that. George watched him suspiciously. Well, I could get it for 600 bucks. The old people that owns it is flat bust, and the old lady needs an operation. Say, what's it to you? You've got nothing to do with us. Candy said, I ain't much good with only one hand. I lost my hand right here on this ranch. That's why they give me a job swamping. And they give me $250 because I lost my hand. And I got 50 more saved up right in the bank right now. That's 300 And I got 50 more coming the end of the month. Tell you what. He leaned forward eagerly. Suppose I went with you guys. That's 350 bucks I'd put in. I ain't much good, but I could cook and tend the chickens and hoe the garden some. How'd that be? So let's pause here. Candy is offering a lot here. He's saying that he'll give them money and he wants to be a part of their dream on this future ranch. In your opinion, do you think that they should include Candy in this in their plan for that future ranch? And why or why not? George half closed his eyes. I gotta think about that. We was always gonna do it by ourselves, Candy interrupted him. I'd make a will and leave my share to you guys in case I kick off. That means die, because I ain't got no relatives nor nothing. You guys got any money? Maybe we could do it right now. George sat on the floor disgustedly. He got ten bucks between us. Then he said thoughtfully, Look. If me and Lenny work a month and don't spend nothing, we'll have a hundred bucks. That'd be four fifty. I bet we could swing her for that. Then you and Lenny could go get her started and I'd get a job and make up the rest and you could sell eggs and stuff like that. They fell into a silence. They looked at one another amazed. This thing they had never really believed in was coming true. George said reverently, 
So go ahead and look this up if you don't know it reverently. George said reverently, Jesus Christ, I bet we could swing her. His eyes were full of wonder. I bet we could swing her, he repeated softly. So right here, thinking about what's just happened, how does George feel here and why? Candy sat on the edge of his bunk. He scratched the stump of his wrist nervously. I got hurt four years ago, he said. They'll can me pretty soon. Just as soon as I can't swamp out no bunkhouses, they'll put me on the country, county. Maybe if I give you guys my money, you'll let me hoe in the garden even after I ain't no good at it. And I'll wash dishes and little chicken stuff like that. But I'll be on our own place and I'll be let to work on our own place. He said miserably. You seen what they done to my dog tonight? Then he says he wasn't no good to himself. They says he wasn't no good to himself nor nobody else. When they can me here, I wish somebody'd shoot me. But they won't do nothing like that. I won't have no place to go, and I can't get no more jobs. I'll have thirty dollars more coming time. You guys is ready to quit. So thinking about. The situation with Candy's dog. And then what he's saying about himself. When they can me here. So when, when they fire me. I wish somebody would shoot me. And based on what's happening here. I want you to look up a term. Mercy killing. And write down what that means. George stood up. We'll do her. He said. We'll fix up that little old place and we'll go live there. He sat down again. They all sat still, all bemused by the beauty of the thing. Each mind was popped into the future when this lovely thing should come about. Here's another word, bemused. Look that up if you don't know what it means. George said wonderingly, Suppose there was a carnival or a circus come to town or a ball game or... Any damn thing. Old Candy nodded in appreciation of the idea. We just go to her, George said. We wouldn't ask nobody if we could. Just say, we'll go to her. And we would. Just milk the cow and fling some grain to the chickens and go to her. And put some grass to the rabbits, Lenny broke in. I wouldn't never forget to feed them. When are we going to do it, George? In one month. Right, squack, in one month. Know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write to them old people that owns the place that will take it. And Candy will send $100 to bind her. Sure will, said Candy. They got a good stove there? Sure, got a nice stove, burns coal or wood. I'm going to take my pup, said Lenny. I bet by Christ he likes it there, by Jesus. Voices were approaching from outside. George said quickly, don't tell nobody about this. Just us three and nobody else. They liable to can us so we can't make no steak. Just to clarify, I have passed over this a couple of times. This is talking about money. Steak. Just go on like we was going to buck barley the rest of our lives. Then all of a sudden, someday, we'll go get our pay and scram out of here. Lenny and Candy nodded and they were grinning with delight. Don't tell nobody, Lenny said to himself. Candy said, George? Huh. I oughta shot that dog myself, George. I shouldn't have oughta let no stranger shoot my dog. So let's pause here about what Candy is saying. He wishes he shot his own dog by himself. He wished a stranger didn't do it, but he did it. So I'm going to answer this question. Do you agree that it would have been better for Candy to be the one to kill his dog? Why or why not? The door opened. Slim came in, followed by Curly and Carlson and Whit. Slim's hands were black with tar, and he was scowling. Curly hung close to his elbow. Curly said, well, I didn't mean nothing, Slim. I just asked you. 
Flynn said, well, you've been asking me too often. I'm getting goddamn sick of it. If you can't look after your own goddamn wife, what you expect me to do about it? You lay off of me. I'm just trying to tell you. I didn't mean nothing, said Curly. I just thought you might have saw her. Why don't you tell her to stay the hell home where she belongs, said Carlton. You let her hang around bunk houses, and pretty soon you're going to have something on your hands and you won't be able to do nothing about it. Curly whirled on Carlton. You keep out of this, lest you want to step outside. Carlton laughed. You goddamn punk, he said. You tried to throw a scare into Slim, and you couldn't make it stick. Slim throwed a scare into you. You're yellow as a frog belly. He's saying he's scared. I don't care if you're the best welter in the country. You come for me, and I'll kick your goddamn head off. Candy joined the attack with joy. Glove full of Vaseline, he said disgustedly. Curly glared at him. His eyes flipped on past and lighted on Lenny, and Lenny was still smiling with delight at the memory of the ranch. Curly stepped over to Lenny like a terrier. And again, I highlighted that green because it is a comparison to an animal. What the hell are you laughing at? Lenny looked blankly at him. Huh? Then Curly's rage exploded. Come on, you big bastard. Get up on your feet. No big son of a bitch is going to laugh at me. I'll show you who's yella. And again, that does mean afraid. Lenny looked helplessly at George, and then he got up and tried to retreat. Curly was balanced and poised. He slashed at Lenny with his left and then smashed down his nose with a right. Lenny gave a cry of terror. Blood welled from his nose. George, he cried. Make him let me alone, George. He backed until he was against the wall, and Curly followed, slugging him in the face. Lenny's hands remained at his side. He was too frightened to defend himself. George was on his feet, yelling, Get him, Lenny! Don't let him do it! Lenny covered his face with huge paws and bleated with terror. And again... There's some more animal comparisons with Lenny. He cried, Make him stop, George. Then Curly attacked his stomach and cut off his wind. Slim jumped up. The dirty little rat, he cried. I'll get him myself. George put out his hand and grabbed Slim. Wait a minute, he shouted. He cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled, Get him, Lenny! Lenny took his hands away from his face and looked about for George, and Curly splashed at his eyes. The big face was covered with blood. George yelled again, I said get him! Curly's fist was swinging when Lenny reached for it. The next minute, Curly was flopping like a fish on a line, and his closed fist was lost in Lenny's big hand. George ran down the room. Let go of him, Lenny! Let go! But Lenny watched in terror the flopping little man whom he held. Blood ran down Lenny's face. One of his eyes was cut and closed. George slapped him in the face again and again, and still Lenny held on to the closed fist. Curly was white and shrunken by now, and his struggling had become weak. He stood crying, his fist lost in Lenny's paw. And here is another animal comparison. George shouted over and over, let go his hand, Lenny, let go. Slim, come help me while the guy got any hand left. Suddenly, Lenny let go his hold. He crouched, cowering against the wall. You told me to, George, he said miserably. Curly sat down on the floor, looking in wonder at his crushed hand. Slim and Carlson bent over him. Then Slim straightened up and regarded Lenny with horror. We gotta get into a doctor, he said. Looks to me like every bone in his hand is bust. So based on what just happened here, Slim is looking at his hand, Curly's hand, and this is what he says. So go ahead and rephrase this in your own words. I didn't want to, Lenny cried. I didn't want to hurt him. Slim said, Carlson, you get the candy wagon hitched up. We'll take him to Soledad and get him fixed up. Carlson hurried out. Slim turned to the whimpering Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. 
This punk sure had it coming to him, but Jesus, he ain't hardly got no hand left. Slim hurried out and in a moment returned with a tin cup of water. He held it to Curly's lips. George said, Slim, will we get canned now? We need the steak. Will Curly's old man can us now? Slim smiled wryly. He knelt down beside Curly. You got your senses in hand enough to listen? He asked. Curly nodded. Well, then listen, Slim went on. I think you got your hand caught in a machine. If you don't tell nobody what happened, we ain't going to. But you just tell and try to get this guy can and we'll tell everybody. And then will you get the laugh? So Slim is threatening Curly here because of what just happened. He got in this fight. Lenny really hurt him. And then George is really scared that they're going to get fired, right? He says, are we going to get canned now? So then Slim threatens Curly. So I want you to finish this in your own words. And you can always go back and reread this part right here. He says, if you try to get Lenny fired, and then fill in the rest of his threat. I won't tell said Curly. He avoided looking at Lenny. Buggy wheels sounded outside. Slim helped Curly up. Come on, Carlson's gonna take you to a doctor. He held Curly out the door. The sound of wheels drew away. In a moment, Slim came back into the bunkhouse. He looked at Lenny, still crouched fearfully against the wall. Let's see your hands, he asked. Lenny stuck out his hands. Christ almighty, I hate to have you mad at me, Slim said. George broke in. Lenny was just scared, he explained. He didn't know what to do. I told you, nobody ought never to fight him. No, I guess it was Candy, I told. Candy nodded solemnly. That's just what you've done, he said. Right this morning when Curly's fist lit into your friend. First, lit into your friend. He, you says he better not fool with Lenny if he knows what's good for him. That's just what you says to me. George turned to Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. You don't need to be scared no more. You done just what I told you to. Maybe you better go in the washroom and clean up your face. You look like hell. Lenny smiled with his bruised mouth. I didn't want no trouble, he said. He walked toward the door, but just before he came to it, he turned back. George, what you want? I can still tend the rabbits, George. Sure, you ain't done nothing wrong. So let's pause for the last time in part three. Do you agree that Lenny didn't do anything wrong in this whole situation that we just saw? Do you, do you think that Lenny didn't do anything wrong? Why or why not? I didn't mean no harm, George. Well, get the hell out and wash your face. 